I just noticed Christoph is not in the this slide. Maybe Paula, you mentioned this when you start the paper. Sorry, it's on my first slide. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, perfect. Oh, no problem. Good, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. Um, we welcome you to this uh, webinar and our speaker today is uh, Professor Paula Bastos. Uh, Paula holds a PhD in economics from uh, Harvard University and her research interests are in international trade and development economics. Uh, she holds uh, several positions uh, and uh, of note, she's the co-editor of the Journal of International Economics, a research fellow at the European Economic Association and a research fellow at the CEPL Development Economics Program. Uh, she has uh, won many fellowships and awards and also many research grants as a principal investigator. And she has also published widely in, uh, uh, including in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the American Economic Review. Um, and therefore we are honored to have her here today. And uh, the talk that uh, she will give is on the effects of uh, climate change on labor and capital reallocation. Uh, we will have 45 minutes, and during the 45 minutes, uh, there will be stops uh, where you can, uh, uh, some of the questions can be answered. If you have a question, you just uh, put it on the chat, and then uh, uh, we'll be able to, to, to handle that. So welcome, uh, Paula. Uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks, Anthony. Uh, thanks for the uh, nice introduction. Um, so let me just uh, uh, try to share my slides one second. Let's see. Okay, are, are you seeing them full screen? Hopefully, yes. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, for for joining uh, the, the the seminar. Uh, so today I'll talk about uh, our recent work on the effects of climate change on labor and capital relocation in Brazil. And this is joint work with Christoph Albert, uh, who is in Colegio Carlo Alberto, and Jacopo Ponticelli, who is in Northwestern University and is here uh, to answer questions on the on the chat. Oops. Okay. Um, so, in terms of uh, motivation for for this paper, uh, one of the uh, you know uh, big concerns uh, we have uh, everywhere now is the what are the going to be or what are the current economic effects of climate change, uh, and. You know, there's especially two type of uh, effects of global warming that um, 
have already started uh, happening uh, across the, the world as a consequence of, of climate change. The first is an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, such as uh, droughts and floods. And the second is that, uh, is that, you know, something that hasn't come up as clearly in the data yet as the first uh, fact, but is one of the strongest predictions of climate models, which is that uh, there will be heterogeneous changes in average precipitation across different areas uh, of the world, um, with increases in high and low latitudes, and uh, reductions in uh, intermediate latitudes. Uh, in particular, the expectation is a, a general drying or an increase in average dryness in subtropical regions, uh, which include uh, Southern Africa and parts of South, of South America, including uh, Brazil, which is going to be the setting of, of our study. Paula, sorry, I think the slides oh, are not moving. The slides. Slides are moving, okay. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, I don't think they're full screen, basically. I think we can still see them, yeah. Let me try to um, share them again and see if... Okay. There you are. Yes? You're okay. in the this favor slide. Okay, perfect. Okay, good. So, um, so developing economies are particularly exposed uh, to these uh, changes in climate for two reasons. Uh, first is that a large agriculture uh, share of their uh, labor force is in agriculture, which is the sector most directly affected by uh, these changes in, in climatic conditions. And the second is that uh, the extent to which uh, you know, workers can reallocate away from uh, the agricultural sector or from affected regions is limited by uh, labor market frictions and capital market frictions. Uh, there, there is some uh, evidence in the literature that uh, increases, for example, in drought conditions lead uh, to uh, out migration from these areas. So there is some uh, reallocation. Uh, however, we do not have a very clear understanding of how uh, capital reallocates away from these areas, which is one of the things we'll uh, bring in this, uh, in this study. And a second dimension that um, you know, is, is lacking from, uh, from the literature is what are the spillover effects of these reallocations of labor and capital on, on destination regions, on, on, on the regions um, that are the destination of this of these factor flow. So this is going to be a second uh, focus of, of the paper. Uh, so the, the setting is going to be Brazil um, in the last 20 years. Uh, this is a, a particularly interesting setting, we think, for two reasons. One is that, uh, as we will show you, warming trends have accelerated in Brazil since the 1980s. And since then, uh, temperature increases have been away uh, or outside of the bounds of normal variation. So this effects of climate change have, have been already uh, being felt uh, for quite a long time. Uh, a second is that uh, we are going to uh, document with a new data on natural disaster reports that we digitized uh, an increased frequency of, of droughts during, uh, during this period. And also an increase in average uh, dryness relative to uh, historical averages, which is data from the last uh, century. So there's both this increase in the frequency of these extreme weather events, but also this increase in average, uh, average road conditions or longer term uh, increases in dryness. So what we will be doing is exploit um, differential variation in these changes in dryness across different regions, both in the short run and in the longer, uh, in the longer run, to identify the effects of these uh, changes, these two dimensions of changes in, in climate on factor relocation. So the first thing we'll do is to look at the direct effects on the local economy of uh, affected regions. And second, we'll estimate the spillover or indirect effects on regions which are integrated with the directly affected regions through labor and capital markets. 
And uh, something that um, we will uh, try to do very carefully is uh, use you know, the very rich data uh, that is available in Brazil to track factor flows, uh, both across sectors, regions, and firms. For capital flows, uh, we'll be using branch level balance sheet data for the universe of bank branches of Brazil. So we will be able to track uh, loans and deposits at a very detailed geographical level. And then uh, for labor, We'll use detailed information on migration in the population census and also social security data that will allow us to track workers uh, across um, space, sectors, and, and firms. So what are going to be the main uh, findings? The, the first uh, we look at is the effects of excess dryness relative to historical averages. Uh, so these are deviations of uh, drought conditions relative to what is normal. Uh, first, uh, in, on capital flows. And here we find that uh, in the short run, which means when you have a bad year or a, a given year where you are experiencing a drought, uh, we observe, of course, a reduction in agricultural productivity and output. That's the first thing we document. And a second, a clear uh, increase very large increase in loans towards affected regions, which is financed by a, a reduction in the loans in connected regions. So basically capital inflows from regions that are connected through a bank branch networks. So this is a classic uh, insurance result. Um, is what you would expect that this short run, uh, you know, if you are experiencing a bad year, you should uh, have insurance. And this insurance is coming from areas that are financially integrated through this uh, bank branch network. A second thing we find is that when these regions experience not just a bad year, but a full decade of excess drought conditions relative uh, to the past century, so just a, a, a and we think of this more as, as this um, longer run effect of uh, climate change that is predicted um, for Brazil, which is this increase in average uh, drought conditions. So here we, we observe is very different. We observe a reduction in loans to all sectors, to agriculture and non-agriculture, um, which is consistent with the idea that uh, the expectation is a permanent reduction in productivity in the local economy. So you don't insure the local economy, but you just pull out investment uh, from this local economy. And interestingly, this has negative spillover effects on connected regions. So it's not only, um, a we don't not only observe a reduction in loans in these affected regions, but also in those regions that um, have bank branches from the same banks. These regions also uh, face a reduction in loans. Um, you know, and here there are uh, basically two explanations. One is that these regions in the short run were insuring the other regions, which are having this persistent uh, bad luck. So it's not just a bad year. So these regions are not uh, giving back the loans. Uh, so that also uh, reduces uh, lending in these uh, regions that were insuring them uh, in, the, in the shorter run. In terms of labor, what, what do we find? We also have a, a, a find a, a relocation away uh, from agriculture and services in these areas affecting drought. So when um, areas uh, face a long, uh, full decade of uh, unusually dry conditions, uh, labor leaves agriculture and services. And within those regions, it relocates towards manufacturing. So workers go to the manufacturing sector. This is a, a classic prediction of a small open economy model with three sectors uh, where um, uh, these uh, droughts reduce agricultural productivity, thus they reduce comparative advantage in agriculture. This means that workers have to reallocate towards uh, the other traded sector, which is manufacturing, and uh, services is going to suffer to the extent that it's non-traded and faces a reduction in demand due to the lower income uh, generated by a lower agricultural productivity. So here, what we see is a classic, uh, you know, a, a classic response as, as you would expect from these uh, classic uh, small open economy models, but only one third of workers, or sorry, 15% uh, of workers uh, move to local manufacturing. 
uh, while a larger fraction are going to migrate away towards other regions. So around 50% of workers we observe living uh, towards other regions. And in those regions uh, where they arrive, they tend to find jobs in agriculture and services, but not in the manufacturing sector. So there is this asymmetry uh, between what happens within regions and across uh, regions. So the next uh, thing we do in the paper is to try to understand why uh, workers uh, displaced from agriculture by droughts go to manufacturing when they stay in the region, but go to agricultural services when they move uh, to other regions. And for this, we use um, the social security data, where what we can do is to construct a firm level a measure of exposure to climate migrants. Basically, the idea is that for each firm, uh, by looking at the share of workers that uh, came in the past from regions that will experience droughts in the future, we can uh, see how exposed employment in this firm is going to be to uh, climate migrants. So it's sort of a firm level version of the classic uh, migrant network instrument that has been used um, a lot in the literature. So what do we find here? Um, one uh, surprising finding is that firms in manufacturing are less connected to drying regions via migrant networks. Uh, this is surprising because um, these drying shocks that we will use, because they are deviations from the long-term average or 100-year average weather, they are going to be um, sort of as good as randomly assigned or uncorrelated with initial characteristics. So drying regions are not different from other regions. So why is it that manufacturing is less connected to these regions? Uh, this is because manufacturing tends to be concentrated in space due to increasing returns to scale. So just by the nature of manufacturing production, this is going to be, these manufacturing firms are, are gonna be less connected to, to the territory. So that's one interesting uh, uh, friction that, that we found um, in the data. And a second finding is that uh, conditional on being connected. So even if they have some workers that came in the past from these areas that will experience droughts, these manufacturing firms are less elastic to these labor supply shocks coming from uh, these climate migrants. Uh, one explanation uh, for this is the difference in skills uh, required for manufacturing and, and agriculture. So that is basically uh, the, the summary of, of our basic findings uh, in the paper. So let me uh, do a brief mention to the related literature. There is a, you know, as you know, rich literature in development, uh, looking at the effects of both weather shocks and long differences in climatic conditions on uh, local acti economic activity and migration. Um, so we contribute to this literature by adding uh, capital flows, what happens with, uh, with capital, which is, hasn't been studied before. And a second aspect that has also been understudied is the spillovers both of capital flows and migration on destination regions. And finally, the fact that we can track uh, climate migrants using social security data also allows us to, to understand other uh, frictions that um, that happen in this uh, reallocation process. And finally, we are also uh, related to the quantitative trade and spatial models that study the long run effects of climate change. So these models um, highlight that the reaction or the adjustment to uh, climate change can be by reallocation across sectors or across space. Um, so one thing that we think is useful um, of what we do for this literature is that we're producing direct evidence uh, on this, uh, the current adjustment to climate change and this can inform uh, which are the relevant margins of adjustment or which are uh, the elasticities of different uh, factor flows to these changes in climate. Okay, so um, let me, um, shall I, I don't know if there's any question at this point or I can go on. No, okay, I'll go on. Um, so 
the rest of the talk, first I'll give you a bit more detail on the uh, situation of uh, climate change in Brazil and on the data uh, that we'll use on, on both natural disaster reports and our measure of excess dryness. And then I'll go to the results. First, we'll look at what happens with agricultural output, uh, then the, what happens in capital and labor markets, and then finally the, the social security data with the firm level evidence. So this is just a slide that summarizes the temperature in Brazil in the last hundred years. And as you see, there is an upward trend in temperature, but this trend has accelerated considerably since 1980, which is the time when climate scientists say that, you know, the increase in temperatures in Brazil were already outside of the range of natural variability, which is taking the basis of the of the 19th century. So here, um, you know, this the way they 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 measure it is by looking at whether uh, you know changes in temperature are two standard deviations above this uh, uh, this reference period. So that started to be the case in Brazil in 1980, and after that there was this uh, acceleration in the in the trend. This is the data we digitized. So this is. Uh, data on natural disasters. Basically, uh, the Brazilian municipalities file uh, reports on natural disasters to get aid from the federal government. So this contains droughts, floods at the municipality level. Um, so as you see, there is an increase in the frequency of these droughts uh, in the second decade, which is also a decade that was warmer in terms of, of climate globally. So this is the type of prediction of climate models that an increase in temperature would increase the frequency of these drought events. So that this data is consistent with these, um, with these predictions. Uh, the, you know, that data is interesting for us. So this data to see what the local population considers a drought that is, um, has serious economic conditions, well, both the, the local authorities and the federal authorities because the ones that we use are the ones that are approved uh, by the federal authorities. Uh, however, there's some issues with this measure. Uh, you could think that there are reporting biases first. Uh, second, that uh, regions that are more propense uh, to have droughts because they are drier, they're gonna have more droughts. And second, that the time span is quite short to look at changes in climate. We only have 20 years. So what we'll do, is to have a second measure uh, that is going to be the basis of uh, our empirical strategy that is going to be based on meteorological variables. And this is the standard precipitation and evapotranspiration index, which basically assumes that in the surface there is like a short grass of the, a very short grass on, on a flat surface. And uh, asks what has to be the um, you know level of uh, rain and level of temperature so that this grows in optimal conditions and then uh, it measures deviations from those uh, conditions using variation in both temperature and rainfall data um, which is measured in in weather stations from this uh, whole century. So this is going to be our measure of dryness uh, that we will use. It's used by meteorologists to uh, predict droughts and it works very well at uh, predicting uh, droughts caused by uh, climate change in simulations. Uh, this is an example of how well it does to predict the drought. So these are, um, you know, zero is the moment at which we see a drought reported in the administrative data. And then uh, the dots are the dryness index. And as you see, the dryness index increases is maximal in the moment when a drought is reported and then, then it falls. Um, so it works really well as a predictor of, of this drought. So we will be using that for identification. So this is the variation in the reported droughts across regions. And you see that they are very much concentrated in the Northeast. Uh, however, when we look at the dryness index, because it's relative to local conditions, 
uh, droughts are more uh, evenly distributed across uh, the territory. So the map on the left is the 2000-2010, which is a relatively normal decade. And the second is the 2011-2010 decade, which is a warmer decade globally and uh, where the incidence of droughts uh, was much higher in Brazil. Um, so this, our identification strategy is going to be just, you know, comparing different uh, municipalities uh, with uh, different uh, levels of, of dryness uh, during, um, you know, the first or the second decade. Um, there is spatial correlation. So what we will do is to cluster uh, the standard errors at micro region level and meso region level in robustness checks to try to account um, for that in the standard errors. Um, so let me skip this. Well, let me just mention one small thing. This is the distribution of dryness um, across different um, municipalities during the first decade. And all our numbers that I'll show you uh, are going to be moving from the median to the 90 percentile, which is the red line in terms of, of dryness. So we'll always compare a municipality in the median with a municipality in the 90 percentile. Um, and this is a balance test just to show that when you look at reported droughts, uh, poorer municipalities tend to report more droughts. However, when we look at this meteorological measure of dryness, uh, there is no difference in the level of development and other characteristics between municipalities with more or less droughts. So we can use these um, uh, dryness uh, shocks uh, to identify the causal effect of increasing in dryness on, on economic outcomes. And that's basically what we'll be doing uh, in the empirical strategy. So now let me pause to see if there's any question on the empirical strategy and before I go to the, to show you the results. Okay. So I think that Jacobo has been taking care of the okay. question so far. Right, thanks. Um, okay, so let me show you first uh, what happens with agriculture quickly. Uh, then let's go to uh, capital and finally labor. So the first thing we do is very simply look at the yearly shocks, uh, basically like thinking about the, having a year uh, with excess dryness relative to the past century. So that's our shock. Uh, y is going to be an outcome, M is municipality. Uh, R is a macro region, which are the big five regions of Brazil. We control for trends across those and then which are these ones and then uh, t is time and then we have this dryness in municipality m at time t and then uh, we control from some uh, municipality characteristics so here what uh, the the graph shows is the effect of a municipality going from the median to the 90 percentile of dryness and basically what you see is that there is a six percent fall in the value of production and a similar fall in the area planted uh, then we do the same uh, by um, uh, the style of the of the distribution, and basically what you see is that you know this is a municipality in the median, and then this is a municipality in the top the style of dryness, and you see very sharp reduction um, in output, and then more rain is not bad in Brazil. So on the left side we don't see uh, improving conditions because of of more rain, but we see that uh, you know a bad year in terms of drought uh, is is really bad for agricultural production. And the same, I'm not going to show you those results, but we also find very large reductions uh, when you have two full decades of dryness. Uh, so we are, we have a, 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 an even larger average reduction of output when you get uh, two full decades of dryness. So basically, our reading of these results is that there is not a lot of scope for adaptation within the agricultural sector, like changing technologies or changing, changing crops, but the losses are uh, quite, uh, quite large. 
So if there is no Taylor of scope for adaptation within agriculture, then um, you know, the adaptation that can happen is the relocation of labor away from agriculture into local traded sectors or to other regions. And that's um, what we look at next. So first, uh, capital. So what happens with capital is that, um, so let, let me, how are you going to, to look at capital? So we're gonna look at uh, the same type of specification, but now we're gonna look at the direct- pa pa Paula, can I, sorry, can I interrupt you one second? Because there were a couple of clarification questions that I think we didn't go through. Uh, and so maybe it's, uh, you know, rather yes. than going ahead. So Dilip is asking, uh, what is exactly the definition of dryness and excess dryness that you are using? And I actually had the same question. What is exactly the, the definition okay. of that? Okay, so let me go back to that. Um, maybe I didn't say it clearly. So let me go back to this. So this, uh, we are gonna use this index and basically uh, this is the, they construct an index of dryness and this index is going to be basically, uh, think of this as, um, you know, what is the temp? So they, they basically use, the, the index is gonna tell you what is the uh, rain and uh, temperature conditions that are good to, to grow a uh, short grass, because you also need to take into account the evapotranspiration, okay? So, so that this, this grass is in good conditions. And then they look at how changes in temperature and rainfall deviate from these conditions. Okay, so this is a measure. And then they normalize it to standard deviation. So basically the idea is that if this measure is a zero, it means that you are in the same drought conditions as you had during the last century. And if this measure is a one, it means that you are one standard deviation above uh, drought conditions in the last century. So it's just an index that measures a relative measure. It's not an absolute measure. Okay. Okay. Thank, th thank you. Uh, I think th there were a few. Uh, um, I'll let you go on, actually, because yeah, I think this was one of the clarification question. Then yeah. yeah so just the go basic, on. Um, because so because we want to measure a uh, climate change, we want to measure deviations of climatic conditions relative uh, to normal conditions. Um, that's uh, that's what we're trying to do. You know how these and, and then the size of these deviations is measured in standard deviations. is normalized, so it's in standard deviations of, of mean conditions. Um, sorry that I was not clear about that. Okay, so what do we do with capital? We look at um, you know uh, we're going to look at different outcomes, and then we're going to measure the direct effect of dryness which is the effect in the municipality where we measure uh, deposits and loans. And then an indirect effect, which is going to be the effect of be, uh, there being droughts in municipalities that are connected to you to financial markets. How are you gonna measure this financial? So what are going to be the outcomes are gonna be loans, deposits and uh, net capital flows, which is the difference using uh, this uh, balance sheet data from the Central Bank of Brazil that tells us in each branch uh, what are these, uh, these variables. And the way we're gonna compute this indirect exposure is basically to take the dryness in a given origin municipality. Um, so this is gonna be the bank exposure of bank B. And this bank has branches in many municipalities. So this is going to be the dryness in each of these origin municipalities multiplied by the share of deposits in this bank that come from each of these municipalities. So the idea is that uh, if a bank has a lot of branches in areas affected by droughts, it's going to be indirectly exposed uh, uh, to those droughts. And then one municipality is indirectly exposed uh, to droughts, which is this uh, measure of indirect exposure if the banks in that municipality are exposed. So basically we sum the bank exposure of all the banks in the destination municipality weighted by the market share of each of these banks. So this in a sense is a measure of a capital market integration between the two municipalities. The idea is that uh, there is a friction in the interbank market 
So banks use these internal capital markets more than the interbank market. So it matters whether uh, you know, two municipalities have branches of the same bank for their financial integration. Okay, so that's the, the idea of the measure. So what do we find? Uh, first, the direct effect, we find this insurance effect that I was uh, referring to that we get an increase in loans to agriculture uh, in areas affected by a bad year. So this is one, one year when you get a drought, you get an increase in agricultural loans. Again, here is a municipality that moves from the median to the 90 percentile of a dryness relative to its past century. So you get an 8% increase in agricultural loans and no change in other loans to other sectors or deposits. And in terms of the indirect effects, so the effects on the municipalities that are connected, these municipalities lend funds to affected municipalities and they take the funds from a reduction to a in loans to agriculture in these destination municipalities. Uh, the reason for this, uh, you know, this in principle could also, you know, take money away from non-agricultural loans. The, the reason for, from this is that there is this uh, rule in Brazil that you need to give a quarter of loans to agriculture. So probably this constraint is binding. So they take, uh, you know, from agriculture and they reallocate within, within agriculture towards the, the other region. Uh, but this is a classic insurance uh, result where, you know, regions experiencing shocks get loans funded by uh, other regions. What happens when you get a full decade of, of excess uh, dryness? So here, the direct effect is the opposite of what we saw before. Instead of, you know, getting loans, you get capital outflow. So basically, there's a reduction in loans, both uh, in agriculture and in non-agriculture. Um, again, this is consistent with an expected permanent reduction in uh, agricultural productivity in the region. And in terms of the uh, indirect effect, we also observe a reduction in loans, both in agriculture and non-agriculture. So basically a negative spillover on these regions that were insuring the affected regions in the short run. Why? Basically because they are not getting their money back. These regions are uh, experiencing persistent droughts. So the, the banks are not recovering these loans and they have to cut credit on, uh, on the local economy. And this time uh, both on agriculture and non-agriculture and the reductions are, are quite sizable. Uh, something that I'm not showing you here is that um, well, maybe, yeah, I'll, I'll mention this afterwards because there's a, this, um, I'll mention this afterwards with this uh, about how this has negative effects also on manufacturing employment. Um, okay, so what happens with labor? We do a similar uh, strategy with labor. Here, uh, we will look at decadal migration flows because that was what we observed uh, in the census. So we're not going to look at yearly flows, but just decadal ones. So we look at the changes for a full decade. And here, we look again at the direct effect and then an indirect effect, which is going to be measured through this uh, labor market connection. So how do we measure that? We use a version of the classic migrants uh, instrument where the exposure of a given destination municipality to dryness through labor market connections is going to be the dryness in the origin multiplied by the share of migrants in the destination that come from this particular origin. Okay, and that uh, the idea is that uh, these uh, migrant networks capture labor market integration uh, between these two municipalities. So the first outcome is going to be a migration. So let me just look, uh, show you the result um, quickly. The direct effects on migration are going to be in the affected municipalities, a quite large uh, outflow of population. So there is a negative net migration flow, which is driven by a 1.1% uh, outflow of population. And in the municipalities that are connected through migrant networks, what you see is the opposite. You see a positive net flow, which is driven by an inflow of migrants, uh, you know, 
uh, towards uh, those municipalities. Uh, this is going to have uh, all effects also on the sectoral structure of the economy. So if you look at the origin municipalities now, the, there is a reduction in employment in agriculture of 7%, an increase in employment in manufacturing of 6%, and a 5% reduction in services. So this is the result that in response to these uh, local shocks, uh, workers leaving agriculture go to the other traded sector, which is manufacturing, uh, and then, uh, but they, you know, the, the services also loses in terms of employment due to this lower demand uh, for, for non-traded goods in the region. In terms of the indirect effect, uh, the regions that are connected through labor markets to these affected origins, see a employment increase in agriculture and services, but not uh, in manufacturing. And this is uh, the asymmetry that uh, we will explore with the firm level data. Um, one thing that we want to understand is why is it that um, the when workers leaving agriculture move locally, go to manufacturing, but when they move to other regions, they do not uh, go to the manufacturing sector. Something else I want to mention here is that um, we also look at the cross effect. So we also look at the effect of the connection through the bank uh, network uh, on uh, employment and the spillover is negative. So remember that areas that are connected through the bank network to drying areas face a reduction in loans to all sectors, they also face a reduction in employment. So this negative spillover that goes through loans also appears uh, in terms of employment, and this employment loss is concentrated in manufacturing. So basically through the two channels, um, the capital and the labor channel, the, the effect on destinations uh, is somehow retarding structural transformation uh, in terms of not increasing or reducing employment in, in manufacturing. Paula, you have five minutes. One minute, okay. So let me five, show you. Five, five. 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 Okay, 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 good. Five okay. minutes. Perfect, how about that? I thought one, okay, good, five is perfect. So let me show you now the firms. Um, this is the result, the cross effect, but let me just skip it. Um, and let me just show you uh, the, the firms. Um, yes, let me show you the firms. So what happens on firms? Um, so why do we want to look at firms first? Uh, so one interesting question is why there is lack of relocation into manufacturing at destination. We want to understand this asymmetry between uh, you know, the local relocation and the relocation to other regions. So what we will do, um, and then this is going to give us a cleaner identification strategy, because despite the fact that we control for connections through, um, you know, when we look at the labor market channel, indirect channel, we also control for the capital market, and we also control for a market access measure that captures the goods market. Um, this is going to give us a, a better way to estimate this uh, labor market channel uh, because we're going to be able to control uh, even uh, for firm fixed effect. So let me show you a bit. Um, we're going to exploit variation within destinations, but also uh, within firms. So let me explain you how, how we're going to do that. So we use the um, employer-employee data uh, from Brazil. Uh, this advantage relative to the census, which we were looking at before, is that it only covers formal workers, while the census has everybody. But it allows us to follow workers very detailed across uh, sectors and, and regions. And now what we will do is construct a sort of firm level version of the classic uh, migrant network instrument. We're going to say, okay, uh, uh, each firm is going to be exposed uh, to shocks in a given origin municipality to the extent that it has already workers that in the past came from that municipality, okay? So this alpha uh, is going to be the exposure of firm I to municipality O, and it's going to be of all the workers in the firm in a baseline period in the past, 
what was the share that came from a particular origin. And if referral networks are active, this is going to be, uh, this municipality is gonna be more exposed to potential uh, labor supply shocks in the future from that particular origin. Um, so this measure, this alpha is gonna allow us to run a, a firm origin level specification where we have the labor flows from origin O into firm I uh, in, in the period 2006, 2010, and then we'll be able to control for firm fixed effects and uh, destination fixed effects. The other thing we'll do then is to have, you know, the effect of being connected in general to a given origin. If you had workers in the past from an origin, is it more likely that you get workers from there? And then an interaction of this initial exposure with a dryness shock. If this uh, sect this region experiences a drought uh, in, 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 in the future, are you going to uh, hire uh, more workers from there? And this could be this labor supply shock from these climate uh, migrants. The, the coefficient on the interaction between the exposure and the, and the weather or the, the dryness shock. Now we're gonna uh, just do a, do get the top quartile of dryness is going to be a dummy uh, that is the dry the dry shock okay so first thing that we found interesting is that if you look at the alphas so the sh share of workers in each firm that come from municipalities that you know will be experiencing this dryness shock we find that Agriculture has 6% of workers coming from there, while manufacturing, you know, around two. So there's a very big asymmetry between how connected are manufacturing firms to these areas that will experience droughts and uh, agriculture. And again, because these droughts are as good as randomly assigned, they are not correlated with initial characteristics. This is just because manufacturing is concentrated in space. So it's just gonna be any set of municipalities that you draw, manufacturing is gonna be less connected than agriculture. So we think this is an interesting uh, spatial friction that must, you know, if you, um, you know, if you look at data from other countries, you should be finding the same because manufacturing is always concentrated in space due to external economies. Um, the second thing we find when we estimate the elasticity to this shock is that even conditional on being connected, manufacturing firms react less or hire less these uh, climate migrants, much less than agriculture. So this is the elasticity is two in agriculture and just uh, 0.6 in manufacturing. And then also large firms are less likely uh, to hire these, mi these climate migrants that disproportionately go. Uh, um, so let me just conclude. I think I'm out of time. Um, but you know, an interesting implication of this is that uh, these shocks are going to have uh, effects on both the sectoral distribution and the firm size distribution in these uh, municipalities that receive the climate migrants, tilting them towards less manufacturing and smaller firms, uh, which we now tend to be less productive. Um, so let me just conclude by highlighting a few of the, of the results uh, that I, mentioned, I know there are a lot of results. Um, so uh, we find that a, a full decade of excess dryness relative to uh, historical averages is going to generate a relocation of capital and labor away from these affected regions. Uh, capital is three to four times more elastic than labor, uh, you know, as you, you could expect. Uh, in, in capital, we find that in, in the short run, there is insurance, but in the long run, there are large capital outflows from these affected regions and negative spillovers on other regions that are financially integrated. And finally, in terms of labor, we find net out migration, changes in the structure of the economy, both locally and uh, in destination regions. And a key friction is a friction to spatial relocation of labor from agriculture uh, to manufacturing due to this spatial concentration of manufacturing that makes it more disconnected uh, from these uh, referral networks. And I think that I finish there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula, for the uh, presentation. Uh, 
uh, you have kept time and uh, that is uh, that is great now we will open the floor for questions so you please raise your hand your virtual hand and uh, ask the question let's go I think Casey had the question, and uh, I think your 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 mic is open actually right now, so you can jump in. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Paula, thanks for a very interesting uh, talk. Very very cool stuff. I'm just wondering. So much of what I see in the climate impacts literature is about sort of unpacking these aggregate reduced form effects of temperature that have been estimated empirically. And what you're doing here is sort of decomposing that in a really interesting way into changes in labor and capital reallocation. And I'm just wondering if you guys have thought about how the reallocations that you see connect to aggregate productivity at the municipality level or things like misallocation. Um, yeah, no, that's, the um, you know, super interesting. Um, we haven't, I mean, the, the, I guess one issue is we can um, try to estimate agricultural productivity, right? And, uh, you know, to some extent, um, you know, we do, but aggregate productivity at the municipality level is hard uh, to estimate because at that level of disaggregation, um, the data on the manufacturing surveys in Brazil is not uh, representative, and the same is going to be with the, the, the survey, the service data. Uh, however, we could try to do something, um, for at least for a subsamp for some subsample of, of large firms for which it's representative. We could try to. Um, we could try to do something, um, but that, that, that would be sort of a back of the envelope calculation. It would be hard to get direct evidence, I think. I don't know, Jacopo, what do you think about this? But No, I think I think that's a great point. And if I could just, just add one thing on this, I mean, we, you know, uh, and somebody was also asking about this in the chat, that there is this sort of asymmetric effect on manufacturing at origin and destination would be interesting to understand more what this reallocation, how this reallocation happens, which sectors are actually absorbing these guys at origin, which sectors are actually, you know, absorbing them at destination, they're likely to be different, having different sort of skill intensity and, and that might help us sort of make some, some progress on the point that you yeah. were raising as well. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good idea. Yeah, to, to look at uh, at least uh, the, the, the productivity consequences of relocation. Right, that that would be a, something we could try to do. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, Dilip, please uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a very hi, interesting sir. paper. I, I I wanted to ask a, kind of a big question, which is uh, you know, when try to uh, understand frictions or deviations from optimum in some sense. The optimum should be defined as a dynamic optimum. And the dynamic optimum should take into account how productivity patterns are changing uh, with climate change, and then also incorporate the transitional costs. Uh, part of it is skill upgrading, but also you know, movement is costly and so on. So in terms of sort of understanding the deviations from optimum, I think, I guess you need some kind of a dynamic model. And I'm just wondering if you are you have a structural version of this model that you could actually use for that purpose. Uh, but even, even the, the friction, you know, that workers are moving not to manufacturing, but to agriculture could just reflect, you know, the kind of skills they have and they don't have the skills required for manufacturing. I don't know if you adjust for that. Yeah. yeah, no, that's super interesting. So, I mean, um, you know, for the moment we don't have, uh, you know, worked on that, on that framework. We see this as a paper kind of, of, of facts Know, the interesting facts um, that, um, and the only point we're making about optimality is more because we have sort of a direct measure of this friction, right? And we have two results uh, when it, 
you could have to, you know, as you mentioned, uh, the fact that when people move to other regions, they go less to manufacturing could be an optimal assignment if the skills they have, for example, are, uh, you know, lower than on manufacturing. So they should optimally go to agriculture, right? That would be a type of Rubzinski effect in a trade, you know, in a trade model without frictions, you would get that. Uh, but we don't get, that's one of the results we get, which is that conditional on getting the, the supply shock, the firms that react more are the ones in agriculture than manufacturing. So that would be consistent with this optimal assignment due to skills. However, there's another thing that uh, uh, can lead to misallocation, which is this asymmetric integration of these firms to this migrant network. So if you think that the referral networks uh, you know, make this relocation easier and then manufacturing is systematically less connected to the territory than agriculture, this is an asymmetric labor market friction to this relocation across space. So we are kind of trying to measure that friction directly. I don't know if that may make sense. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think so. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one other hand up. Uh, oh, uh, hi, thank you. Yes, please this go is, on. Yeah, this is a, a Tan Nagong, a PhD candidate at the University of California, Davis. Um, I major in development economics, but uh, this topic is very interesting. I started to write some proposal on it. One of the questions I encountered is about how the climate change interact, the policies interact with the effect that you found here. In particular, in Brazil, they have a policy about credit, rural credit access. So if you didn't follow the climate change policy, for example, the deforestation policy, and then, um, then you can see that those Brazilian legal Amazon areas, many of them do not follow. And there's a quite heterogeneity among those municipal municipalities and that may generate distributional effects of these climate change issues because it interact with the climate change policies that can affect the resource allocation through rural credit access. So, um, yeah, that's just like interesting to me, but I thought, I guess, also may interest some climate change researchers about these policies interact with the equilibrium effect. Yes, this is super interesting, actually, uh, to think about um, which type of policies help the adjustment and which ones make it more difficult. So looking yeah. at it, this is very interesting, um, you know, for us to, to, to look at this interaction, definitely. Thanks for the suggestion. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so there is a there is a, a link that has been shared. If uh, anyone would, uh, any of us would like to uh, continue the discussion, you can join uh, through that link. Um, Tobias is asking whether it is possible to distinguish migration effects by skill level. Yes. Yes, yes, it is. Um, it is because the population census has information on, on skills. We've, we've looked at formal versus informal and we found that flows were very similar, but now I don't remember if we looked at skill versus unskill. Jacopo, do you remember if we did that? Uh, sorry, I was trying to answer <laughs> the questions in the chat, and I apologize for the ones I haven't answered yet. I'm, I'm trying to do it now. Uh, yeah, we, we we could look at that. We haven't. Yeah, so was... yeah, we, we we just looked at formal informal, and we found that they flow in the same direction, but uh, we haven't looked at skilled and unskilled. So we, we could so remember that you yeah you can only see the skill you know um, mm. at the end end point, but you can you don't know you know how skilled they were you know at the beginning. So you know we only observe like one part of the yeah, of that, of that, um, of the flow, yeah. the end point. Okay, any other question? Any other question? Okay, um, 
We don't have any other question. Alejandro, Jacobo is the a question by Alejandro, but uh, uh, asking about. Um, so I think Alice, Alice has actually a question, live question. Okay. Maybe, maybe you yeah. want to take that one. Thank you. I yes, was Alice, go ahead. Yeah, I was just hesitating, but uh, I, I can ask my question. I was uh, thinking that you look at. Uh, uh, flows of labor and on the uh, separately you look at uh, capital flows and I thought that uh, maybe I mean capital in particular in these uh, settings may move with migrants and uh, can you try to maybe uh, disentangle a bit what uh, what is a part that can be linked I mean just to look at these two sides of of a story uh, separately maybe um, a little bit uh, uh, at least uh, it's a specific view of the of the problem, but perhaps it would be interesting to link the two. Yeah, no, that would be super interesting, actually. Um, we only observe the capital flows that go through the banking sector. Uh, so that is a limited, you know, uh, all the informal uh, flows, for example, uh, that, you know, in developing countries, you know, could, could be important. We don't observe at all. Um, so we can, um, you know, to the extent that migrants have a bank account and they transfer money to their bank account in a different municipality, then we can observe. But if they bring cash, um, we, we don't observe those, um, those flows. Um, we could do something about this uh, with the central bank data. We could do something a bit more detailed about this. Um, which, because there we can um, link the social security data with the bank accounts and then we can see whether people move with savings and all that. So that's something that we are working on for, for, a, for a newer project uh, where we are going to be able to, uh, to track the flows together, no? the labor and capital flow um, together. But yeah, because... Yeah, not, 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 not yet. We don't have that yet. Okay. My point was that policy implications are not necessarily the same. If the okay. capital uh, response is, uh, let's say, from external capital or if it's the migrants, I mean, it's not clearly the same uh, interpretation of the results. Yeah, and but actually what we find is that there is a... So, okay, so let me... So what we find... Um, is that in areas that are connected through the bank network, there is a reduction, uh, you know, in the long run, there's capital outflows and they receive, uh, you know, the, and then areas that are connected through labor markets receive, uh, receive migrants. Uh, so I don't think um, we are finding an increase in, in capital in these regions. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it's not, you know, we, we are seeing capital outflows from these uh, connected regions, actually. So okay. the, domina the dominant effect is a negative spillover effect. So you could think that these regions are receiving more workers, but less, less capital. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Alice, for that final question. And thank you, Paula, for the very interesting presentation on uh, climate change and uh, labor reallocation. Um, we are very grateful and uh, delighted that you could make it uh, to this. And thanks to the participants. Uh, the next uh, uh, talk will be on the 8th of November. We shall have a, a Debra Ray uh, on the 8th of November. And you are all welcome. Thank you. and. Uh, Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Bye. Thank you. Bye, 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 Paula. Bye, Jacob. Bye. bye. Thanks, Thanks a lot. lot. Bye, everyone. Thank you for all the comments and questions. Thanks.